Michael Sheridan is the author of A New History of Hong Kong and China and a longtime foreign correspondent in Asia, the Middle East, and Europe. He was the Far East correspondent for the Sunday Times for 20 years, based in Hong Kong and later Bangkok. He delivered political and economic news from China, Japan, North and South Korea, Southeast Asia, and Pakistan, and has also covered some extraordinary events that have unfolded in the last couple of decades, including the rise of China, the handover of Hong Kong, and of course the upheaval in Burma, the fall of Suharto in Indonesia, and other reporting as well, as well as coverage of multiple assignments to natural disasters involving mass casualties, including the Asian tsunami of 2004. Michael has also interviewed key figures in Asia, including Li Huan Yu and An San Suu Kyi. Welcome to Silicon Curtain. Please like and subscribe to hear more great speakers and content on the channel. And do also consider becoming a patron to support the work we do or buy me a coffee. Uh, Michael, welcome to the channel. Thank you. Hopefully that intro, that intro was just a, a small fragment of, of what you've done and achieved. And we will, of course, be putting uh, links to your books in the description. Um, that's the history of Hong Kong and the People's Republic. And a previous, oh, well, the next book, I think, is going to be titled Red Emperor. Um, but we'll put those into the description. Yeah, then the next book will be a popular biography of Xi Jinping. I'm working on that at the moment. And the title is The Red Emperor, which uh, I, I think says it all. I, I may even borrow that for the uh, the title of this episode, but we'll see when I come to name it. Um, the first question, I think, is the tendency with the rise of Xi um, and in many other parts of the world, a sort of slide towards authoritarianism. Uh, but does the recent election in Poland show that actually this slide is not inevitable? and that democratic processes and institutions can uh, resist what seems to be um, a worrying trend towards more personal authoritarian rule. Well, what we saw in Poland was a democratic election operating as it is supposed to, uh, despite push and pull from both sides. Uh, that doesn't apply in uh, China because there are no elections. And uh, the country is officially described as the People's Democratic Dictatorship. Within that, uh, China says that it has its own version of democracy. Uh, they will tell you that there are, in fact, multiple parties working with the Communist Party. These are just figureheads, really. This is a, a top-down authoritarian system. It borrows from the bureaucracy run by Chinese emperors for thousands of years, it mimics dynastic politics in the way that factions coalesce and dissolve and uh, quite often uh, cohere around one individual. Uh, what we see at the moment, however, is a new trend. It's a recent development uh, under Xi Jinping. Uh, and essentially, to make it as simple as possible, we need to understand that from 1949 to 1976, China was dominated by the titanic single figure of Mao Zedong. After Mao's death, there was a sequence of leaders who began what they call reform and opening up. And while the most significant of those leaders, Deng Xiaoping, was undoubtedly a figure of great authority, he was not a godhead or a cult figure like Mao. And the Chinese elite together with uh, non-elite partners in the party hierarchy and the, and the system, basically evolved a consensus that they did not want to see again a single dominant figure as powerful and autocratic as Mao Zedong. Now, putting on one side China's travails over democracy and reform and massacres and repression, what we can see is that from the 1990s until 2012, you had, in effect, a collective leadership. There were different figureheads and factions, but there was no one single dominant figure. And a lot of Chinese people think that that actually wasn't so bad because it meant that there was restraint, it meant that their 
or policy discussions, all, of course, within the context of the Communist Party remaining the sole dominant ruling party. But there was a sense that China was moving towards a sane, collective, rational form of leadership. Now, enter Xi Jinping in 2012, and more significantly in 2013, when he got all the significant posts that, that accrued to him. And you have one man who is in charge of the state as president. He's in charge of the Communist Party as general secretary, and he's in charge of the military as head of the Central Military Commission. And those triple titles have not been held uh, by anyone with such individual power before. Uh, Deng Xiaoping, for example, who was the dominant figure of the reform era, uh, was never president of China. Um, he didn't feel the need for it. But under Xi Jinping, you've seen, uh, I would say, three trends. One is concentration of authority in a single leadership figure. Two is the rebuilding of the personal brand. Chinese people and school children are now instructed to study Xi Jinping's thoughts on everything from music to agriculture to artificial intelligence. And the third trend is uh, towards a harsher, more internal looking, uh, xenophobic and repressive system of governance. It is reverting to the old ways under socialism. And there is no doubt that Xi Jinping is very strong, and that is the course he has set China on. And what you see uh, in Russia, of course, is that whereas there may be people who are uncomfortable with this concentration of power, there may be people who would prefer to return to a more, uh, let's say, a collective uh, way of coming to decisions, a more pluralistic way, even if it's behind the scenes, as it were. Um, they are, however, afraid to move forward, uh, distrustful of colleagues and distrustful of the fate that may befall them. Now, of course, in Russia, this typically involves open windows and nasty accidents. Um, what is the fear that stops people speaking out, uh, even within the system in China? And what are the risks and punishments for those who who may want to try to reverse back to the previous state of affairs? China remains a police state. Uh, it executes more people than anywhere else on Earth, I think, even relative to the uh, size of its population. But it doesn't conduct uh, murderous purges uh, in the way that was routine 40 or 50 years ago. Uh, it imprisons its opponents, uh, it harasses people, it uh, uses the legal system as warfare to suppress anything it doesn't like. Uh, Xi Jinping oversaw the show trials and the imprisonment of two or three of his particular rivals. They, as far as we know, are in maximum security prisons. Their families have not been touched, as far as we're aware. So the instrument of power uh, is exercised more softly, but that doesn't mean it's not effective. I would underline an institutional difference between the Chinese and the Russian uh, systems. In Russia, what we see is uh, one man dominance, uh, a clique of gangsters, basically, uh, Putin, Shoigu, uh, Lavrov and the others uh, are people who one day might be brought to justice under a, a, a reformed Russian legal system. I wouldn't rule that out, uh, but it's a it's a it's a gangster clique. And uh, as we saw with Putin's treatment of uh, Yevgeny Prokhorin and uh, what happens to various opponents, it's pretty brazen about the way uh, it conducts itself. And equally, the way uh, that Russia has been turned into a kind of kleptocratic state. Quite interesting whether there would be Putinism without Putin. One suspects not. Now, in contrast, in China, you have an enormous political institutional apparatus. There are more than 95 million members of the Communist Party. There is a well-honed uh, institutional and government structure. 
the party operates alongside the government. There are well-established uh, institutions like the National People's Congress, the uh, Standing Committee of the Party, uh, the Central Committee of the Party. All of these operate as a machine. And uh, Chinese leaders have been known to complain from time to time that it's difficult to get the machine to work, but it does uh, unfold effectively when they want it to. Uh, look at zero COVID, look at the one China policy, uh, look at their measures in uh, Xinjiang. So I think the difference is that if Xi Jinping was to uh, fall off his reviewing stand uh, by accident one day, there would be a smooth operative institutional succession. The party uh, is still institutionally strong. It has not been hollowed out completely. Uh, we see the form of authority in China uh, as incarnated in the leader, he's described as the core, uh, and then there's a coterie around him of about half a dozen people who are uh, his party theoreticians, the people that write the speeches. Um, we don't know the level of internal debate uh, within the uh, Politburo Standing Committee, which is the group of seven men, all men, who run China. But we do know that there are policy differences, particularly on the economy. So it's a completely different institutional set. And so uh, the comparisons between Putin and Xi are a little bit hard to draw precisely, except to say that they both uh, like autocracy and detest Democrats. Mm -hmm. This is an interesting point, and this is one which I think a lot of the rhetoric that tries to lump Russia and China together sort of misses some of the subtle differences. And if we look at uh, comments by, say, Yuri Feshinsky and, and, and some others, they will point out that during the Cold War, Russia had a certain division of power. You had the security forces um, on the one hand, the FSB, KGB, etc., or KGB at that point, Czech, Czechists. Um, you also had the Communist Party. And, and in some respects, they were bumping up against each other. They were having to negotiate around certain points of disagreement. Um, you had the so-called uh, thieves in law. So you had a sort of oil in the machine, which is general kind of thievery mafia which is part of the whole machine, but not visibly so. And there's divisions between the people who are operating it. So you had some kind of division of power um, or, or some weird plur uh, you know, plurality. Um, it's been pointed out that these have merged uh, under Putin. The secret state, the mafia have merged into a single structure, which Putin really is the representative of. The party has ceased to exist. So it's, it's simply a sort of rubber stamp um a, a created entity really to create a fig leaf of uh of, of 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 a sort of plurality and of course institutions like the church and the army are completely subordinate again to that sylvia key uh, class if you want does this make it actually quite different from china are there still um, much more distinct divisions of power divisions of influence which need to be negotiated within the Chinese system. First and most important thing to remember is that Chinese politics is a black box, even compared to Moscow, where you can see and divine a certain amount by what's said. There's an exile opposition. There's uh, a much more vigorous uh, media coverage, both abroad and within Russia, social media and so on. Other voices are, are heard. Within China, all those voices have been extinguished to, to all intents and purposes. Now. In researching this next biography of Xi Jinping, I'm really struck by how the edifice of the Chinese communist state is actually borrowing from very, very old structures. It is copying imperial institutional methods. Uh, in fact, uh, the very latest Chinese uh, official magazines and uh, journals are reporting speeches and seminars in which uh, they discuss what they call the very excellent and ancient Chinese civilization and how it has refreshed Marxism-Leninism and how what is on offer in China is a blend of Confucian Chinese civilization and learning plus the enlightenment bestowed by Marxism and Leninism uh, 
So an entirely new, cohesive, as they see it, political philosophy has emerged. Now, this is also new because... A long time ago, in the uh, in the in the sixties and seventies, Mao talked about exporting revolution, and then all that stopped. And so, one thing the Chinese diplomats and officials, including Xi Jinping himself, said uh, through the eighties and nineties and the the early part of this century was that China was not trying to export revolution. It wasn't trying to impose its model on anybody else. Uh, at that time, it wanted to join the World Trade Organization. It wanted the Olympic Games. It, it, it sought to embed itself in the world trading structure. So it used its soft power, I think, very effectively because most people felt benign and, and positive towards it. A very admirable uh, civilization and country in many ways, incredibly hardworking people. And, you know, anyone that's traveled in China, you just cannot help being impressed by the hard work and diligence and intelligence and devotion to education uh, that Chinese people manifest. So that phase has come to an end, because what we've seen in the last year or two is an explicit statement that the Chinese model, as they see it, uh, is now something that is a model for the world. They've said so the last two or three conferences that Xi Jinping presided over a rather ridiculous gathering of, of uh, leaders for a so-called initiative for civilization including people like Bashar al-Assad, uh, and talked about how uh, the methods that China used, for example, in dealing with COVID-19 and the way it is renegotiating trade and the foreign policy stance it takes, which is, uh, uh, as they see it, very independent and, and resistant to hegemony. These are all hallmarks of a new world order. Now, the previous three leaders of China, did not speak about a new world order. This guy does. And this is something new. I think the Americans are, are belatedly across it. Uh, China's neighbors are much more concerned than they say in public. What is emerging is a dictatorship of an entirely new kind, fortified by technology, <clears throat> enriched by trade, uh, balancing its interests and its actions uh, very shrewdly, what is the partnership with Russia all about? Well, it's about a shared dislike of uh, democracies and free markets and uh, anything that interferes with the exercise of power by uh, 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 an elite, which is why they're also friends with Iran. But it's also about masking very profound differences between China and Russia. Let's not forget that China and Russia have actually got a bloody history. Uh, they fought wars uh, in the 19th century, and they fought a, a border war in the late 1960s. In fact, there are chunks of Russia that Chinese revanchists claim were stolen from the Qing Empire. So there are unresolved issues. I mean, we know, for example, that in Central Asia, the two countries pushed and pulled at each other and through the turbulence of the 20th century, there was a deal or an understanding between Stalin and Mao that allowed the Chinese uh, revolutionary authorities to take over <clears throat> in Xinjiang in Western China after 1947. So it's a complicated history. They don't much like each other. And in fact, Russian nationalists have spoken with uh, concern about the population imbalance between a densely populated Northeast China and a sparsely populated Far East of Russia. So let's not pretend everything is, is sweetness and light between these two. It's very transactional. If you look at the hard numbers, talking about oil supplies, building new pipelines, gas for China, uh, weapons exchanges and so on, it is very hard headed. Nobody is giving gifts to anybody else. If, however, uh, if, however, you're talking about the personal relations and the geopolitical ambitions of Xi and Putin, then we're in different territory. I would draw everyone's attention to a remarkable moment when Xi Jinping visited Moscow, came down uh, the carpet from his meeting with Vladimir Putin alongside and said in the hearing of 
and microphones that there are changes in the world order unseen in a hundred years and we are the ones driving them so here are the two most controlling autocrats in the world they do not let remarks drop lightly that was an intended message change is unseen in a hundred years and we are the ones driving them and if that doesn't make the democracies wake up i do do not know what will. And this seems to be a marked change, doesn't it? Russia has uh, really under Putin uh, and since his sort of Munich um, security conference speech um, really marked out that territory of wanting to disrupt or even bring down the Western order. So this isn't a change in narrative on the Russian side, and it shows a degree of continuity going back to the USSR. In China, however, um, as you say, it seems there has been a policy of trying to work with the system to put China's stamp of authority on it, but work within that international free trade rules based order. I don't know whether this is actually true, but I did hear it in a documentary about the uh, nineteen uh, in the the financial crash uh, of two thousand and eight that Russia at that point approached China and said, "Right, this is the great opportunity." to bring America down. Let's, we can do this, you know, recall the debts, crash the American economy. And by all accounts, China was, was absolutely horrified at this kind of political nihilism. Um, has China fully jumped on board with this so-called multipolar concept of Russia's to, to change the world order? Uh, or are they somewhere in between? Because it seems to me the Russian concept is not to replace one rules-based order with another rules-based order, but to replace a rules-based order with might makes right, a sort of lawless order. And that surely cannot be the in the interests of China. Let's get one thing straight. China has done very well out of the existing world order. Its economy has multiplied many times. Its people have raised you know, themselves out of poverty by the hundreds of millions. Its share of world trade its exports, its technology have all exploded. Chinese people live far better generally than they did 30 years ago. They live far better than they did when China joined the World Trade Organization. So China is a net beneficiary of the rules-based order. And the wiser heads in Beijing know that very well. That doesn't stop them being opportunistic because alongside the broad desire for China to grow and to get wealthier and to give better lives to its people, which I believe is sincerely held by many of the people in the party and the government, is a sense that China is a country that has suffered enormously. Its ambitions uh, are great. Uh, it was, as they see it, uh, assailed and, and plundered in the 19th century. Let's not forget it was invaded by Japan in the 1930s. Japanese militarists explicitly sought to break up the country. They believed that China was too big as one unitary state. So these wounds go very deep and millions of people died. The question, I think, as the historian Andrew Roberts has raised recently in a column, is at what point do you move on from historical grievances? Uh, we can think of you know, the Franco-German partnership. We can think of Central Europe. Uh, you know, Hungary, you will still hear people talking about the Treaty of Trianon and complaining about lots territories, but by and large, Europeans have put that behind them, as have other groups around the world. India, Pakistan and Bangladesh now coexist. Uh, so the question really is, to what end is the Chinese regime under Xi Jinping making more xenophobic noises, banging the nationalist drum, talking about ultra-patriotism, flirting with military action in the uh, East China Sea and the South China Sea, which would frankly be disastrous for everyone. They're doing it because there are a group of ambitious and unscrupulous and uh, uh, very, very hard men around Xi Jinping, including his chief theoretician. And there are people in the People's Liberation Army who genuinely believe that there is a Chinese mission to take revenge for the evils of the past and to uh, reunify with Taiwan, to expel the Americans from Asia, and to reorder the security of the Pacific. I mean, these are mighty ambitions, and they are not realizable at the moment. 
Uh, they're not realizable under any circumstances without a very, very violent uh, period. So you have to ask yourself, why would rational politicians in a country the size of China with all its domestic problems embark on such rashness? Uh, and it does come down to the ambitions of a few unscrupulous people at the core. Frankly, all my reading about Xi Jinping suggests to me that he's not very intelligent. He's very shrewd. He's had an extraordinary life from the uh, paddy fields and the, the, the bare terraces of uh, central China as a, as a forced laborer during the Cultural Revolution to the military, the government through provincial governorships and all the way up the party organization. Nobody would dispute his, his uh, uh, raw political instincts and his work ethic and everything else. This is not somebody who's terribly widely read. He hasn't traveled very much except within an official cocoon. He interacts in a ritualized way with visitors. He doesn't have the kind of relaxed uh, exchanges with other leaders that can break down barriers. So it, it's a very uh, curated power image. He's quite isolated psychologically. And, uh, you know, exchanging pleasantries with uh, Vladimir Putin and the Iranians and, and Kim Jong-un and various African potentates is not going to challenge you intellectually. People are going to tell you what they think you want to hear, um, which is why it's very healthy that the Biden administration have really gone into gear over the last uh, 10 months. And, you know, they have banged on the door of Beijing uh, to make it abundantly clear uh, what the consequences of a war would be, uh, how the two countries should get their relationship back on track. Um, they have talked and talked and talked and talked. And I think it has had some effect. But what you see in China right now is an absence of other voices. We don't know much, if anything, about what goes on in the Politburo, but we do know that there's only one voice coming out of it because that voice is called the voice of Xi Jinping and it is in all the media. And that, of course, is a, is a concern. You mentioned in a, a recent article that the sudden death of uh, Li Keqiang, China's uh, former prime minister for the last decade, he was an individual who may have towed the party line, may, may not have uh, you know, opposed the uh, Uyghur uh, repressions and so on. Nonetheless, he had a better understanding um, of the dynamics of the market economy. He's been posthumously labelled a liberal. I don't know if that's really appropriate in those circumstances. But you've also made the point that she probably does not understand the complexities that underpin uh, China's economy, which, which is now an incredibly technology-led complex entity, unlike the Russian one, which is still based on extraction industries and a relatively simple uh, sort of dynamics there. Is this is this a, a real worry? We do know that uh, there are voices and factions inside the party. Uh, when it comes to the economy, there are certainly contending schools of thought, and they are allowed to contend. However, what is very clear is that under Xi Jinping, there's been a move back, as the Chinese themselves put it, uh, from the private to the state. The state is mightier yet. There has been a process of tightening control over private businesses. The Communist Party has led a very zealous uh, program to make sure that it has cells uh, inside each major company. In effect, there is no such thing as a private company in China. The legislative structure, uh, new security laws, uh, governance procedures have all tended towards reinforcing central control, and the power of the state. So that forces your economy in one direction. We do know that there's a school of Chinese economists who have long maintained that it is possible to have a, a socialist market economy operating under a closed political system, a one-party state, but nonetheless giving play to different economic actors, private sector, local governments, big public sector, 
uh, big state enterprises. And there's been arguments uh, about uh, policy and the monetary policy, fiscal policy. Uh, what does the government do about the credit problems, uh, intervention uh, in the property market? There's clearly well orchestrated intervention in the in the stock markets. But the philosophical direction is very clear. Xi Jinping has said it himself that China is moving back towards an economy where the state is paramount. He's actually said, you know, the party is everything, north, south, east and west, the party commands all. So that's very different from economists like Li Keqiang, who liked to experiment with market mechanisms, looked at the West, uh, talked a lot of technocracy, saw many ways in which China with its political system, could adapt certain aspects of a market economy. What we seem to be witnessing is a change to uh, risk aversion, de-risking Chinese style, which is that you stop any trend towards power centers, financial power centers, economic actors who do not obey and follow the party completely. And there's plenty of comment, uh, particularly outside uh, mainland China, so the Hong Kong financial sector and, and, and uh, analysts in Singapore and elsewhere, uh, who say that Xi Jinping is storing up major problems for the Chinese economy because you will not be able to replicate the rates of growth and the extraordinary opportunities which China saw between the late 1980s and a few years ago. Another interesting point that emerged from that is, again, for the more simplistic um, commentators who tend to lump China and Russia into the same basket and advocate similar solutions for both. Does that ignore, perhaps, that actually they're driven at its core by very different systems? Um, I'm less familiar, obviously, with China than, than Russia, but Russia could be characterized as a systemic kleptocracy where corruption is not a bug it is the system itself um you could go further and say that it runs a extraction economy with a system of what i call tenured thievery it's people are given rights to farm out certain parts of the economy and and thieve from it um that seems to me at uh stark contrast to the chinese system where corruption and Battening down on corruption and nepotism has been a feature of Xi's narrative. So how different are the systems? And actually, how, in reality, uh, is this drive against corruption and nepotism more than just sort of sound bites? The key campaign promise of Xi Jinping is the fight against corruption. He talked about it from the moment he took office. He's run a series of purges. Uh, they have brought down hundreds, thousands of people, some of them very prominent, generals in the army, eminent business people, uh, swathes of middle-ranking cadres. Two forms of corruption in China. One is the day-to-day -day graft by petty officials with their handout, which all hands out, which all Chinese uh, will talk to you about. That's very much local level. And then there's what I would call the uh, institutional state family corruption. Uh, they used to say that under Republican China in the days of Chiang Kai-shek, there were only four families that counted. But now in China, there's about 200, I would say. And their members are represented on the Central Committee. They're scattered throughout the boardrooms. You see them at the helm of big enterprises. Uh, the sons and daughters of party leaders have gone into financial services. Xi Jinping's own relatives were exposed as the owners of a, a very lucrative uh, empire of investments and real estate in Hong Kong and elsewhere uh, some time ago. Um, it's said that he has cracked down on them himself. Uh, this is not so much about um, just a philosophical aversion to corruption, although I believe that Xi himself does absorb the notion that communism is supposed to be better than that. Don't underestimate just how ideological he is. There is also a tendency to realize that uh, this is a very in useful instrument against your rivals. So, for example, the security chief, a very nasty piece of work called Xiao Yongkang, was brought down shortly after Xi Jinping took power. 
And it turned out that as well as running China's entire security apparatus, he found time to dominate the petro sector as well and had placed his uh, relatives and friends in lucrative positions throughout it. It was a, 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 a glaring example of egregious uh, rent seeking and uh, power hoarding with an authoritarian state at your back. So uh, we also know, perhaps inadvertently, from uh, public trials and statements from the very powerful Central uh, Committee for Discipline Inspection, which is the anti-corruption arm, that a lot of corruption is institutionalized. And that, you know, these are not uh, slurs on China or secrets. They're things that Xi Jinping himself has said. He has lashed out about it. Now, you could say that China has had institutional corruption since the earliest dynasties of, of, of the emperors. Um, what they want is to have a more efficient state, a more efficient economy, uh, get their hands across the tax revenues, uh, get local government spending under control, uh, rein in entrepreneurs who uh, grow fiefdoms that are too big. These are quite measured things. I mean, we don't like them because they're completely antithetical to a Western liberal democratic capitalist economy. Compare that, however, with Russia, where there was just looting of the economy, um, settling of accounts, uh, the so-called privatizations, uh, the oligarchs. None of that happened in China. You must remember that. There was a period of chaos in Russia through the 1990s and into the early years of this century, which Xi Jinping and his lieutenants see as a warning from history that they don't want to repeat. And so time and time again, they talk about order, stability, uh, the party controlling the economy, and uh, they now talk about a dual circulation economy, so there's more inside China. They talk about responsible capitalism. They talk about the responsible use of markets. There's a heavy emphasis on curbing powerful actors. We've seen it with Jack Ma, the uh, boss of Alibaba, which is a huge technology giant. Other figures less, less well known abroad have come down. And uh, it's a very centralized, well run, uh, autocratic, whimsical, uh, capricious, but nonetheless quite effective uh, authoritarian apparatus. And the aim is to keep order and not let China descend into the kind of kleptocratic chaos that is so evident in Russia. And that, that, that's difficult to challenge, actually, because the, the, the destructive power uh, and the, um, the prevention of wealth generation is, is quite clear uh, in the Russian system and the way it sort of blocks um, innovation, uh, too. Another aspect, which I think is interesting to explore, because I know we're, we're, we're sort of running out of time shortly, but I, it seems to me one very important aspect of that type of system is continuity. And continuity also implies inheritance, inheritance potentially of wealth and influence, but also um, inheritance of ideas, values, cultural traditions, and so on. Um, I have the impression that China has been more effective at that form of continuity but the diaspora has also played a much more active and constructive role in the continuity of values, uh, preservation uh, of wealth and so on. And that actually, when you look in deeply at, at Russian culture, there is a, a broken inheritance mechanism that generation after generation, there's a failure to transition uh, from one generation taking power to another, a failure to transition all these things like cultural values uh, and so on, um, and and a failure to organise, communicate, and so on. Now, this is this is very broad, um, but I but I wonder if if you think this is a useful area to explore. Looking at the comparison, one of the many tragedies of of Putin's Russia is that the Soviet intelligentsia, which which was extraordinarily skilled and highly educated, Russia excelled in physics and mathematics and the sciences, as well as, as we all know, the flourishing heritage of literature and music and so on, uh, there was this uh, reserve of extreme talent in Russia, uh, particularly in the scientific side. And in China, you equally have a reverence for education, a sort of force-fed examination system, 
but you also you have had much more opportunity in the last 20 or 30 years for uh, young people in particular to flourish and to start companies and have jobs and innovate and get ideas. You see it in how the Chinese internet has grown in a non-political sphere uh, and how small companies, when they were allowed to flourish, have given full play to the incredible talent that there is in China. Um, it's unrivaled probably in, in the sheer weight of numbers it can bring to technical innovation. It's uh, education system is is first rate the you know the long centuries of intellectual development in china which were suddenly accelerated in the 19th century by the reformers and educational reform and opening up and then by the shock of war generated this incredible flowering both inside china despite all the chaos and war and of course as you say in the diaspora so you've got external wealth you've got an uh, internal social capital, intellectual capital, an extraordinary academic lineage going back centuries. Uh, the remarkable thing is that China has done so well, even though its people operate in such a limited you know, freedom and political space. Uh, I like to think what on earth could be unleashed uh, if young Chinese and, and the uh, intellectual elite were able to give uh, full play to their talents, in which case we really all would have to look out. Yeah, I mean that's that's uh, that's one of the problems, isn't it? That balance between maintaining control and and allowing a level of freedom that uh, that, that that stimulates innovation. If we take this to more of a geopolitical level, and 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 sort of this is probably the the last question area. Um, what is the impact of the Russo-Ukrainian war on the sort of uh, a um, sort of Asian conflicts, challenges, tensions. Um, and how is China viewing this? Because you wrote a very interesting comment, uh, I think, in one of your articles, that China does not necessarily view Russia's um, inability to fulfill any of its strategic objectives as, as actually as a failure. I mean, we, we almost certainly are looking at Russia's war as an incredible failure based on the loss of life, material, and so on. Um, but how is China viewing it? And how might this war have changed China's thinking towards Taiwan, NATO, and the West? China has a long history of uh, war fighting uh, without heed of casualties. Uh, there are people alive in China today who can remember what is called the war to support Korea and resist America. 1950 to 1953, when the Chinese poured hundreds of thousands of volunteers into the Korean War, saw them slaughtered. Uh, those who died included Mao Zedong's own son. And the country has moved on from it, uh, partly because of authoritarian control. The troops came back, they were applauded. Uh, there was a Korean settlement, an armistice, not a peace. So they know about futile wars, but they also see that the uh, such wars can be of political service. The last time the PLA was really in action was against Vietnam in 1979. <clears throat> it's generally concluded that they got a bloody nose, but it served the purpose of China at the time, which was to show that it would act uh, assertively on its borders. So two things, really. Uh, Chinese public opinion, insofar as we can measure it, is highly conditioned by years and years and years of filtering and control on the internet. And a, a, an eminent Chinese publisher once said to me that the whole point about the Great Firewall is not that it stops you finding things out. If you really want to find out about Tiananmen Square or Tibet and you're in China, you can find a way around the internet and get that information. But because of the firewall, that information will never naturally reach you. So in other words, if you really want it, you can get it, but you're not going to receive it in a flow of regular information. Over the years, that creates perception. And if you look at what we know of opinion polls in China, they are very resolute in supporting a strong line on Taiwan, on Japan, uh, resisting America, uh, all this kind of thing. The party has been very successful at conditioning opinion. So 
that's the public opinion. It's very receptive to the storyline that Russia was under threat, that Putin acted to save his country, that NATO intended to uh, threaten Russia. Do remember that NATO bombed the Chinese embassy in Belgrade <laughs> during the Kosovo War, so there are memories there. Uh, and the party's very adept at taking all these grievances. It's a grievance culture. It's a grievance form of politics. And when they want to, they can stir it up. So that's the public perception. Very difficult in, in getting uh, a clear view of Chinese opinion on Ukraine and indeed on Israel Hamas at the moment, because there's a narrative there, for example, where uh, Chinese government television only shows pictures of death and destruction on the Palestinian side and has failed to show Chinese viewers what Hamas did uh, at the start of October. So it's not what you say or what you broadcast very often. It's what you don't say and what you don't broadcast. So public opinion is conditioned. What do we know of opinion strategically at the top um, Wang Yi, who's now in charge of uh, foreign policy, uh, Xi Jinping himself, uh, the other members of the Politburo who have, uh, so I beg your pardon, the Politburo Standing Committee, who have practically zero foreign policy experience between them. Uh, I think it is opportunistic. They seek division and weakness uh, among the industrialized democracies. Uh, they see uh, any challenge to American power, any diversion of American attention as useful to them. Remember, these are Marxist Leninists who are schooled in revolutionary politics, and they know what Lenin said and what Stalin said about action and fighting and seizing things from your enemies is their modus operandi. They do things because they can. If they realize that they can't, then by and large, they will avoid a fruitless sacrifice. But China is uh, reactive to these kind of crises. It, it likes to pretend it has a diplomatic role in the Middle East, for example, but it's a, it's a, sh a showcase, really. Uh, it wants to play more of a role on the world stage. This is principally determined uh, for the domestic audience to puff up the idea that Xi Jinping is leading a mighty China, which in many ways he is. Uh, and it's also to serve notice to China's neighbors in Asia that they need to get in line. So public opinion, hard to measure accurately. We can pretty much divine what the strategic thinking is in Beijing by what they do. That's absolutely uh, fascinating, Michael. I think there is a, probably a thousand uh, further questions that I have in follow up. <laughs> Uh, so, Michael, this has been a, an incredibly stimulating conversation. I think it's the start of many episodes, actually, that will focus on uh, not just China, but other areas of the world, for instance, Syria, uh, Iran, um, global South African continent and, and so on. Um, but thank you so much for sharing your insights with us.